Welcome to Windows on the World, bringing you cutting edge news, empowering information and no conspiracy theories. This week's show focuses on our forgotten and hidden history, a subject we have covered previously on Windows on the World. Check out the archive and listen to previous interviews with many researchers including Brian Forster, who researches ancient cultures including the Paracas people of Peru. In this show, Brian discusses the theory that ancient civilized culture could predate the Sumerian Akkadian culture by at least 6,000 years. Um, what we are learning now is that the end of the Ice Age happened in less than three years. The, uh, the oceans of the world rose by 350 feet in a maximum of three years, possibly less than a year. And according to Dr. Schock, it could have actually been less than two weeks. And so that created an incredible destabilization of not only the planet, but the people and cultures of the planet. And so um, that was very up to date and absolutely intriguing. It certainly is, because that ties into what people like Graham Hancock have been saying for quite some time. Um, does this tie in with your area of research? Does this, does the timeline of this, does this make, an, make sense to you with, with your research into the megalithic cultures of Peru? Oh, definitely, because the thing is that there's more and more evidence that Cusco especially and other megalithic um, sites in that area and also in Bolivia which are not explained properly by conventional archaeology because um, you know they simply state that there were no cultures uh, in the area say prior to two or three thousand years ago but if we're looking at megalithic constructions which are twelve thousand plus years ago and if those cultures were devastated or in fact wiped out by this uh, what is presumed to be a galactic event, then it adds more fuel to the idea that we're looking at the fact that humanity um, as, a, as civilizations goes back at least twice as far as we've been taught in terms of Sumeria, uh, ancient Egypt, etc. Uh, we've been conventionally taught that those were the first high cultures, but in fact they have, may have been actual renaissance of, um, of older cultures which preceded them by 6,000 plus years. It really ties into the idea of the collective amnesia as well which is very interesting um, but how does it tie in do you think to these Paracas people um, who, who seem to be fairly anomalous in with with the other cultures um, you, I think you state that they, the, they may have been wiped out by the Inca I mean we're talking well, about, yeah sorry come in yeah, well, actually, the thing is that the Paracas culture are very obscure on many levels. Um, what is known so far through uh, conventional archaeology is that they seemingly suddenly appeared about 3,500 years ago on the coast of Peru. Um, and even uh, all of the archaeologists I've talked to in Peru and outside of Peru don't know where they came from. So there's no pre-culture to connect with the Paracas, they just suddenly appear, and then 2,000 years ago, they seem to have been, uh, I think, wiped out by the um, the Nazca culture that moved into the area. This whole area around Paracas and Nazca uh, began to be destabilized in terms of climate, starting about 2,000 years ago. The whole coastal area was turning into a desert due to uh, very powerful El Nino events and so the Nazca people who previously lived to the north uh, northwest moved into the Paracas area which uh, still is very uh, heavily agricultural and I think not only blended in with the Paracas but in fact wiped them off, uh, wiped them out because the elongated skulls basically disappear with the end of the Paracas culture they, they weren't very prevalent amongst the Nazca that's very interesting because 
I recently did a talk and I used some of your video actually to show the difference between cradle boarding and these particular schools, these Paracas schools that you have in the museum there. Now, you, you've been doing quite a lot of research into this. What would you say about that? Well, the vast majority of the skulls were intentionally um, deformed through some sort of um, cradle boarding or other um, simple technique. However, there are, I would say, between 3 and 4 percent of the skulls which are very different. They, they appear to be quite natural. You don't see obvious flattening of the forehead or perhaps even more importantly the back of the head uh, because the contraption used uh, was basically either a type of leather or wood that was used in the front and the back of the skull and then with textile wrapped, and this of course was done to the royal babies, and then um, basically over the, the course of six months to three years, the deformation was, uh, was performed. But some of these other ones are very uh, complex in terms of curvature, both in the front, the sides, and the back. And I think they are actual examples of people that could have been born that way, and they would have been the last of a line of humanity that um, through breeding with normal humans um, eventually disappeared and that's why the deformation was done. It was in order to try to retain the look, I think, of a, a small genetic population which um, have not been accounted for in conventional archaeology or anthropology. It's very interesting that because when we look at the pharaohs, they seem to have taken on this practice. Do you think that it's possible that the Egyptians visited many different continents and they may have learned from this priest class. Have you, have you got any, any thoughts on that? Well, the thing is that uh, cranial deformation, uh, the changing of the shape of human skulls, has occurred on all six populated continents. Um, going back in time as far as ancient Iraq, possibly 30,000 or more years ago. Um, the thing that um, is common amongst all of these different cultures, whether they be in Central or South America or throughout, actually throughout Europe, as well as the Middle East and uh, parts of Asia and Melanesia and Australia, etc., is it was always the royal class of people and uh, the three characteristics or, or reasonings behind why this was done amongst the royal bloodlines was A, it was thought to increase the intelligence of the children, uh, B, it was thought to increase the, intelli increase the intelligence, um, sorry, increase the intelligence, uh, it was thought to be very aesthetically pleasing, and then number three was that is what the ancestors looked like, and that's where it becomes quite curious, because who were these, you know, who were these ancestors that may have looked that way in various parts of the world? An example of Inca, not Inca as in royal Inca, but Inca as in the time period of the Inca. This is a normal shaped skull, and this person's cranial volume was 1,200 cubic centimeters. Now this is an example of cranial deformation. The volume of this skull is 1,100 cubic centimeters. So again, basically normal. And you can tell, obviously, the deformation by the way it was flattened this way. String was wrapped around this way, possibly a board or some kind of material this way when it was a child. And the flattening was done in order to create this shape, which was desirable by these people. Now, another clue here is you see three cranial plates, which is normal. Your skull has that. The frontal, and then the two parietal plates. Now the Inca one has that as well. It's a normal feature in a human being. And then we come to the Paracas. And this skull is very different from the other two I've shown you in many different ways. One thing is 
in terms of plates, there are only two. There's one frontal and there's one parietal. There are not two parietals, only one. The volume of the skull is 1,500 cubic centimeters, so 25% larger than the Inca skull, shown as the uh, example of what normality is. Also, the eye sockets are much larger. The nose seems to be larger. It has these two holes in the back, which are indicative of where nerves would come out of the skull to feed this part of the head. That is not a normal feature in a human being, in a normal human being. Now the shape clearly could have been uh, achieved via uh, deformation in order to, because we can see this obvious transformation here. However, it's the volume and the fact that there are hundreds of examples of this. There are actually five different kinds, five different styles of elongated skulls here in the Paracas History Museum. That could represent five different social classes. We don't really know. No one studied this since 1928. And there seems to be a genetic um, tendency to have fewer teeth, especially molars. In some cases, uh, there are at least four more, uh, molars missing. Other cases, eight. And some people have said that that would be the result of a poor diet, which isn't true because the Paracas area was incredibly productive in terms of producing food. This is an elongated skull in the Paracas History Museum in Peru. As you can see, the hair color is not Indian. Indian hair is black. Native American people have black hair. This person doesn't. You can see in the sunlight, you can see what color it is. This was an auburn redhead. This baby had an elongated skull. So the question is, was this skull bound soon after birth in order to achieve this shape? Or under this wrapping, is this a naturally elongated human skull. That is the, the burning question. You can see this skull is clearly different from you. This is a mother. And this is probably her baby. And they were buried together. You can see the ornate work on the textile and that was not done for common people, that was done for royal people. So that's especially important to take note of. This may be the only elongated baby skull known. I, the museums in Lima might have one or two, but they, they hide everything in boxes. They don't even bother taking them out to study them found in the same tomb as her or his red-haired mother here. 
The ornateness of the textile shows that this was a royal person. And Senior Juan guesses the age at about one year. So this baby has 11 ribs. A normal human has 12. Another important point is the neck. Both the alignment of where the neck is and the thickness, the bones of the neck are a lot thicker than a normal human and this might indicate that nature did this. Also, the, def the, the skull looks incredibly natural in shape, so it probably wasn't deformed on purpose and that indicates that this little individual may have been born looking this way. Okay, so we have skin samples from the baby and from the fetus. And both were found buried together um, in this area, which I will not totally divulge because somebody's obviously going to try to come and scoop this idea or this story, which they're not allowed to do. Because anything we do here is to be a benefit to this museum and the man who runs it. We're going to be covering the redhead giants on on the show soon, and I'd like just to get your um, your information really on on this red-haired race because you've written about them, you've written books about them, haven't you? About this seafaring race of red-haired people um, that seem to have gone to many different continents and have been discovered in in the Americas um, as, and and in North America, also known as the mound builders. Um, can you can you tell us a bit how how you think that might tie in with it with them with possibly the the elongated skulls? Do you think there's a connection between these these people, these seafaring race, and the and the people with the elongated skulls? Well, the intriguing thing about red hair is that, of course, it represents a very small percentage of uh, even modern day populations, and people erroneously believe that red hair originates in Scotland and Ireland or necessarily amongst the Celtic people, but in fact, uh, through genetics, we know that um, its origins are in the Middle East, and you find, even to this day, in Iraq, Iran, um, Afghanistan, and other uh, nations in that area, that there are still um, red-haired people with blue eyes and, and green eyes. So that's where the origin is. Um, you do find red hair written about in many different cultures around the world amongst the, uh, the people of Israel or the royal bloodlines of Israel, um, Polynesia, and what's intriguing about the Paracas is that they predominantly, at least the royal family, predominantly had very dark red hair, which is not um, a typical Native American characteristic. Uh, not only that, but as you were saying, the so-called red-haired uh, giants, of, uh, predominantly of North America, uh, again, seem to have had genetically red hair. Um, and so it opens up the idea that uh, the standard story of, of every one of the Native American peoples um, who have ever populated the Americas came across the Bering Land Bridge and were all um, black-haired and dark-skinned. Um, many native uh, cultures in the Americas talk about that upon their arrival, these so-called giants were already existing there, and by giants we're probably talking seven feet, eight feet, or possibly nine feet tall, but I wouldn't say 
any bigger than that, but that uh, then these native people actually uh, went into battle with these so-called giants and, um, in general, wiped out their existence. Yeah, it's very interesting when you say that um, that the that the red hair is not really um, a, a native thing to to the British Isles. However, there there does seem to have been um, a, a, a migration into. Um, Scotland and Ireland of, 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 of these people um, in, in, in fact there's a place in Scotland called Sukoth which, which is right at the end of a lock and it does tie in with um, a Hebrew speaking people coming in it's very interesting this and, and what we're trying to do I suppose is, is put this, this jigsaw together and, and find this out because it ties all in also with the rhesus negative blood the RH negative blood with the red hair, um, have you have you got anything to say about your research on that? Uh, not really at, at this point. Yeah. That is uh, quite an intriguing factor. Uh, but I think the important thing is that through modern genetics, um, we're discovering all sorts of things. Like the you know, the, um, we have to rewrite the history of uh, of humanity in many ways. Not only in terms of civilizations and what they created and have left behind for us, such as stone structures of uh, profound magnitude and quality, but also the different types of uh, humans and humanoids that lived on this earth. It's not a simple question of Cro-Magnon, uh, Homo erectus, and, and Homo sapiens sapiens. There seem to have been possibly many other smaller uh, groups of genetically different people who were capable of breeding with one another, but th that these um, these other bloodlines began to disappear um, as probably as the result of the overzealous um, combative nature of, of Homo sapiens. We have a tendency to uh, to take things over, like taking over nature and quite possibly taking over other genetically related but not exactly the same um, bloodlines. When I've looked into certain bloodlines that are, that are uh, around the world, um, that seem to combine into a, into some kind of priest class, which indicates maybe there is some ancient hidden knowledge, which which certain people on the planet actually do know about. What do you think about that? Well, I think definitely. Um, it again, the red hair is associated um, in general with the royal classes, and in terms of royal classes. In many cultures, you're talking about the so-called kings and queens, but you're also talking about the religious or spiritual class being a part of that as well. Um, so I think definitely, uh, if you look at a lot of the different oral traditions from around the world, again, this um, you know this red hair uh, appears. Usually, it's, it's quite an old bloodline, such as in Polynesia. Um, there are still people who live in places like New Zealand and Easter Island and Hawaii and Tahiti who have this this very dark red hair and in general that's regarded as being the pre-Polynesian people who existed on these islands prior to the expansion of the, uh, the Polynesian cultures which began more or less around I think uh, in the neighborhood of 100 AD um, and I think it's quite silly to to think that islands such as New Zealand which is quite large was first populated you know, say 500 to 1000 AD, and that all time before that, there were no humans. It's, it's too big a landmass to have been missed, and we also have to take into account that people have been traveling the world's oceans for thousands upon thousands of years before Christopher Columbus or the Vikings. That's absolutely correct. I'm doing some very interesting interviews with Stephen and Evan Strong in Australia. Have you come across their work before? I have, and actually yeah. the, uh, the interesting uh, relationship is that when I was in Egypt in March and April with uh, the Kemet school of uh, Yusuf and Patricia Awian, they were able to, or at least Yusuf and Muhammad Ibrahim, who were masters at knowing the, uh, the true knowledge of Egyptian hieroglyphics, were able to actually translate the glyphs that were found in Australia. And they said that, they de that these glyphs deliver a very coherent message, that it's not something that uh, probably was faked in recent times because it is an ancient Egyptian script and it does tell a very clear story. 
that's very interesting. I have featured the Carry On Cliffs and they they are right in the middle of nowhere really, as a lot of these sites in Australia obviously are, um, in New South Wales. And they, they, these people have been trying to debunk this as though some students went there drunk one night and then <laughs> these incredibly intricate carvings. But um, the, it's not really a surprise that, that um, people of Egypt would have traveled there thousands of years ago, is it? It's not, it's, it's not really that anomalous that that would happen. No, it isn't, because when you look at the, the drawings of some of the Egyptian ships, uh, when you see examples of them in Egypt, what you can tell surely by their design and by the sh uh, sail shape and, um, and formation that these were not necessarily built to uh, travel on a really uh, calm river like the Nile. These are open ocean, uh, large vessels. And of course, with the incredible abundance that the Egyptians had in terms of gold and silver and precious gems and, uh, and other exotic materials, they weren't necessarily getting all of that from their local area or even from people coming in to trade. They may very well have had major expeditions out to places such as Australia in order to acquire materials such as gold because as we know to this very day, uh, Australia is incredibly rich in terms of materials, so like gold, um, opals, diamonds, you know, etc, etc, etc. No, it's very interesting and Stephen and Evan Strong seem to be finding quite a lot of these sites. A lot of them have been bulldozed. Obviously the, the farmers um, were, were kind of coerced into doing this, otherwise the land would have been taken, um, it seems. And that Stephen and Evan seem to have quite a lot of trouble with authorities over there, even when they visit these places. Um, it's, it, it, it's very, very difficult and quite frustrating trying to, trying to decode this history as it is obviously being hidden and it's people like you and, and Stephen and Evan are, are, are really trying to put this put this jigsaw puzzle together. And so what we what we're really talking about is that humanity is far older than we are being told, um, by a very very long stretch, isn't it? Well, I think it, uh, it's not necessary that I don't think that humanity is is extremely old, but I think sophisticated humanity is much older than what we've been taught. Uh, you know, the standard story is somewhere around, say, 4000 BC, we have the emergence of um, reasonably major societies, and that before that, everyone was more or less a hunter-gatherer. And for all of the profound things uh, that we still have to this day, such as the pyramids in Egypt, um, etc., to suddenly spring out of nowhere, that all this engineering knowledge suddenly um, evolves in the course of a very short time doesn't make any sense to me. So I think what uh, through, again, the research of people like Dr. Schock um, and others, learning that there was a catastrophic global event that happened approximately 12,000 years ago, whether it was a, uh, a comet or a meteor or um, plasma ejection from the sun or an uh, eruption of energy from galactic center or maybe all of the above that um, the planet um, was impacted and severely altered and I think that's where the concept of amnesia comes in because what we're looking at is we're looking at high societies that did exist that uh, did have possible contact with each other they were capable of traveling the world's oceans then this major event happened the um, world's oceans rose by 350 feet very rapidly so any um, civilizations on the ocean or near the ocean had to abandon their cities, etc., quite rapidly and uh, move to other parts of the world and then re-begin. But also major environmental changes were happening. A uh, high percentage of the population was wiped out. And therefore, this caused this state of shock and amnesia, which uh, author Barbara Han Cloud calls catastrophobia. So do you think some of these megalithic cultures in, in the, um, the mountainous regions of Peru could have survived this, or do you think that they were wiped out as well? It seems that they were either wiped out or they, uh, the survivors had to abandon the area and wait possibly for 
thousands of years to return because according to Dr. Schock and others, um, if it was plasma ejection from the sun, it literally would have been the equivalent of plasma lightning that happened on a grand scale. And this would have uh, not only vitrified the surface of stone, but would, would uh, vaporize any living material in the area, such as people and plant life. So those that did survive would have basically nothing to eat in quite a large area, and thus to survive would have to move and wait the time out for uh, the land and vegetation to reestablish themselves. Well, that's very interesting you bring up vitrification because that's something that's been discovered all over the world, these melted rocks. And obviously it's going to take extreme temperature to do that. And there, there is um, some the theories that it's some kind of cosmic war going on, but it probably would make sense that it's some kind of massive catastrophe. Um, have you looked into this vitrification? Yeah, there are possible examples in Peru and Bolivia, and also uh, Dr. Schock showed uh, slides of, um, I think it was a fortress and a tower in Scotland, yeah. and he being um, a PhD geologist was able to discern the fact that uh, the surface of the stone had been flash heated, um, and it couldn't have been done by simply somebody lighting a fire or even a forest fire in the area. It had to be incredibly intense um, heat energy that could have taken possibly even milliseconds to affect the stone in this way. That's that's very interesting. Um, the work of Robert Schock um, and his, his uh, redating of the Sphinx caused quite a, a controversy, but if, if what you're saying um, and, and th this seems to be quite a consensus emerging about this global catastrophe um, and it's, it's tying up with quite a lot of people's work um, yourself, Robert Schock, Graham Hancock, that there, there does seem to be that, that this um, this annihilation of um, worldwide. Um, so, how do you think that ties in with with the the with the pyramids and the Sphinx? Um, have you got any ideas on that? Well, Robert Schock has clearly shown that the Sphinx um, was shaped. Uh, thousands of years prior to the uh, the rise of the dynastic Egyptians. And so conventional chronology says that the Sphinx was shaped probably about 2500 BC, but he's dated the weathering, uh, the, the water weathering of the Sphinx at possibly as much as 8000 BC. Uh, therefore, the Sphinx had to have been carved before that time. Um, the weathering could not have been done by wind and sand. It had to have been done by, by uh, precipitation. And the only time that uh, that area had sufficient precipitation would have been in the area of 10,000 BC or even farther back in time. It's my belief that the, uh, the pyramids of the Giza complex are also uh, contemporary to the Sphinx and are at least 10,000 uh, plus years old, so they were not created by the dynastic Egyptians as far as I'm concerned, but are artifacts, again, of this much, one of these uh, much older cultures. It would appear that way. I covered the Bosnian Pyramid on a show a while back, and uh, that's a very, very interesting place because it has this ancient concrete covering it. That's in it's incredibly durable, and, and they're stating that the people who work with Dr. Samus Monagic over there, and scientists who've been over, say that they, the, the most ancient parts of that site are up to 29,000 years old. Um, does that tie in with anything that you've been researching? Well, I, I've never been to Bosnia, so I can't really comment about it. I, don't, I try not to comment about places I haven't physically been to, because it requires uh, my own experience of a, of a site to be able to discern uh, whether or not the stories told about them are valid or not. Um, and therefore, um, you know, I, about, the Bos about Bosnia and some other sites, I simply have no comment at this point. I've heard um, from some experts that they believe that, they, uh, that the Bosnian pyramids are real and yet others vehemently say that they're not. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I have no opinion. 
yeah, I, I only know people have been there and it's, it's quite a recent thing for me. Um, I've also looked at the there's some YouTube videos of Siberian megalithic sites. Have you, have you, have you seen those at all? I've seen photographs, yeah. but again, uh, from the photographs that, that I've seen, uh, and again, I'm not a, a geologist, but um, they could be natural formations is the point, because stone can fracture both horizontally and vertically and create the look of a megalithic wall, but it doesn't mean that they are megalithic. Um, so that again is something that I would have to, I'd have to see a lot more uh, video and many more photographs before I could even have uh, an inkling of an opinion. But more importantly, I think I would have to visit the site and, and see for myself whether I can discern the presence of tool marks. Um, and even better would be to bring a geologist along uh, to figure out if those formations are natural or if they were necessarily uh, manipulated by humans or if it's a combination of the two. Yeah, it's very difficult to tell at this stage with, with those particular ones, but it's, it's, it's very interesting that, this, that the, there does seem to be this ancient global culture and, and it's people like yourself and other researchers that we've had on the show who are, who are looking into this and trying to piece that jigsaw puzzle together. So uh, thanks for being on Windows on the World, Brian. Speak to you soon. Always my pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Windows on the World. Remember, keep watching those, watching us, watching Windows on the World. We'll see you soon.